long lasting partner with the IPS in organizing these events. We are very good, grateful to them. And uh, finally, I want to once again welcome all of you and hope you will benefit from today's deliberations. Thank you. May I now invite Dr. Howard Nicholas to make an introduction to his book. Dr. Howard Nicholas is the senior lecturer, University of Erasmus in the Netherlands. Um, he has an illustrious uh, career and uh, an introduction, which I'll have to unfortunately keep brief. Dr. Nicholas has been closely studying the global economic trends and investing in equity and bond markets. He hosts several uh, seminars for the business community in several countries, including the Netherlands, China, Spain, and Belgium. And he has also done extensive research on the Sri Lankan economy, particularly when he was residing and teaching in Sri Lanka. Dr. Nicholas. Thank you very much, IPS, Professor Luxman, Saman, Sumana. Thanks very much for inviting me. Uh, it's an honor to launch my book here. Actually, this is the only place I'm launching it. And there's good reason. I mean, Macmillan said, Sri Lanka? Why Sri Lanka? You should have gone to LSE or London or so on. And I've been saying this for a long time. We need the center of gravity moving away from the advanced countries, it's developing countries. And I consider Sri Lanka my own country. So for me, I don't feel any loss launching it in Sri Lanka. And I know that Macmillan's hopefully eventually will understand uh, when they see that there was publicity, a lot of interest. I'm very grateful that uh, people have come here. And certainly it means a lot to me. Uh, a little background is important. Uh, forgive me, actually, if I sort of use words like asset classes and equities and so on, because from 7.30 this morning I've been giving the Sri Lankan business community, a lecture on asset classes. So, you know, those jargon stay with me, but I'm going to try and focus on uh, my book and presenting that. As someone said, it's a long journey, but actually it's a very different journey from the PhD. And uh, to be truthful, it diverges considerably from the PhD. The thing about a PhD is it's a learning process. You learn what you don't know. And at the end of it, if you really think you have achieved something, you really haven't done a PhD properly. Uh, you, you really should realize how ignorant you are of the subject matter rather than an expert. And that's really what happened to me. Before I started the PhD, I really felt I was the defining word on Marxism. I knew everything there was to know. Uh, when I finished, I realized how really ignorant I was, and I hadn't got a clue what I had really done, to be perfectly honest. I'd used all these big words and sounded wonderful, dialectical this, dialectical that, historical materialism, value, blah, blah, blah. <coughs> but if someone asked me a simple question, well, what does all of this mean, I would have been totally lost, you know. So it was the beginning of a journey. And it's a bizarre journey in a way. I mean, I'm talking about 1983, so indeed, as someone said, it's an atrociously long time ago. Uh, believe it or not, Macmillan's offered me my first contract in 1984. By this time, I was so humbled by my real ignorance that I, I just couldn't get it together. Uh, so when I called Macmillan's last year and I said, look, I've actually got this book ready, and there is such a contract on your files, the editor-in-chief said, just hang on a minute. And I could hear this loud laughter in the background, you know. So she had obviously told everyone in the office, there's this lunatic on the phone <laughs> who actually has come with a book that he was supposed to have written 30 years ago. So I had to convince them that it wasn't the same book. 
that actually it was part one of six parts. So actually that's what it is. It's part one of six parts. I've been rewriting this book, six parts of it, endlessly. And, you know, in order to write the first part, you have to research the whole thing over and over again. And I must tell you the truth, in the middle, I just thought Marxism is a load of garbage. At a certain point, I thought this is the biggest load of crap I've ever studied in my life. Let me really critique Marx. Let me seriously critique that. And now I'm going to tell you something that you will find absolutely outrageous, I know, if some of the other things are not too outrageous. This is the most outrageous. I actually, after writing a PhD on Marx's economics, for the first time in my life, I read Das Kapital. You know? Up to that point, I'd read others who had read Das Kapital. But I never read Marx, although I was the definitive authority and I used to go and give lectures here, there and everywhere, I'd actually never read even one sentence of Marx. So boring, you know, so difficult, so tedious to read, that I used to fall asleep, you know. Whenever I needed to fall asleep, I would open a copy of Das Kapital and start reading, you know, and then I would fall asleep. And I thought, you know, let me bury this guy once and for all, this hocus pocus jargon nonsense. And there it started, and I couldn't let go. I suddenly realized, my God, there is so much in this book that I never saw anywhere else. And I don't care what people's political beliefs are. I don't care if you're left or right. Actually, my point is, I, w I predict one day Marx will become the institutional economics. Because what I've done is I've actually taught various aspects of Marx's economics to investment bankers, to business schools. And I can tell you that the evaluations are so good that they keep asking me to come back. They don't want the crap in the textbook. The quote, unquote, we don't want the garbage in the textbook. We don't know where this guy is getting his ideas from, but they're really useful for us, unquote. You know? Now, when Cornell University took over Nanjing Business School and said, OK, we are going to bring all our academics, the students protested and said, no, we actually want this course continuing. And I didn't even tell Chinese people I'm teaching from Marx. I teach financial markets to investment bankers in Hong Kong. They have no idea I'm teaching Marx. They said, you know, this is not in any textbooks. Where do you get all this differential interest rates and structured money markets and so on? I say, well, I invented it, you know. I mean, I can't say it's Marx, can I? Can you imagine what they would do to me if I said, well, I got it all from Marx, you know. Theory of money. If you look at what Keynes did, what the neoclassicals did, it's really like the Dark Ages. It's like the Neanderthals by comparison with Marx. And this is not me saying it. You really look at investment bankers this morning. So many bankers came for the seminar who wouldn't be seen dead in a room with a Marxist, you see, because I used to teach in Sri Lanka to all the bankers here, financial markets, which is basically Marx, you see. Now, because when I did this reflection on Marx, I became so impressed with his economics. I mean, I'm. I say nothing about the politics. I don't care whether you're revolutionary or non-revolutionary. This is purely a scientific analysis of a capitalist society. That I thought I've really got to take this seriously, take it on board, and try to the best of my ability to translate it into plain English. I'm not sure I succeeded. To be perfectly honest, it's a difficult book. It's a very difficult book because what I'm trying to do is to clear the deck. I'll be honest, I want to butcher neoclassical economics in a way that you know, kills it forever. You know, I want to lay a platform because I think it's really nonsense. I think it's ideological nonsense which is misleading generation after generation. And I do think that now is an important opportunity for an alternative. And I do believe that Marxism does provide that alternative. But the downside of what I'm saying is, to a large extent, it's 
stripped of some political connotations that have always been identified with Marxism, okay, which uh, many people say are pivotal and central. I don't believe so. I think that Marx understood that what he was conducting was a scientific inquiry. Uh, of course, the implications are very radical. It lays bare the source of profit. I mean, this is the bottom line. This is the reason why traditional price theory was abandoned. I call that classical price theory because it kept emphasizing the source of profit is excess labor expended. Now, they had to get away from that because that was such a bad ide ideological message for capitalism to turn around and say, well, you know, we're actually making money out of your blood, sweat and tears. I mean, that's not really a great ideological message for a capitalist. Much better to say, well, profits come from the productivity of machines. All nonsense. Everyone knows it's utter nonsense. They get into so many contradictions. But the minute you take Marx's theory of price, you end up with coming back to the theory of profits, which is pivotal to all economics. And you can't escape it. Actually, one of the people that tried the hardest and the greatest intellectual, I think, in the last hundred years, economist, was Pierus Raffa. And I think he came the closest to attempting to overthrow Marxism. But I think he failed in the end. Uh, not miserably, because I think it's a great book that he wrote in 1960, Production of Commodities. And I respect him greatly. I think he was an academic far in advance of all the other academics. And I include people like Keynes in that. I think Sraffa was one of the great economists. And, and I know that because he was such a great economist, that's why we never use Sraffa's work in any economics department in the world, or very few of them. You know, because any economist that threatens the status quo, which Sraffa did, is always neglected. Now, what is this book about? Uh, it's the theory of price, yes, but it's a bit more than the theory of price, because the question is, why did I choose price? Why start with price? What is so special about price? Well, actually, price is the most fundamental economic unit. You get the theory wrong, everything is wrong. When you explain price, you have to explain money. They're both interlinked. You explain price incorrectly, you get an absolutely stupid theory of money. The classic example is neoclassical economics, which believes that inflation is caused by too much money in the system. This is so stupid, and we have said this for years and years and years, how stupid can you get that inflation is caused by too much money in the system? Now the US Federal Reserve is printing money like it's going out of fashion. I gave a quotation today that people found incredible. The US Federal Reserve and the other central banks combined have printed over $20 trillion in three years. Where's the inflation? They've printed more money in the last three years than in the last 50 to 60 years in GDP terms. Where's the inflation? But you open any economics textbook. What is the fundamental tenet of that macro section? Inflation is caused by too much money. But that follows logically from the neoclassical theory of price. This is the problem, that they can't get out of it. Now Keynesians try and get out of it, but they make an even bigger hash of the whole thing. Because Keynes never left a theory of price. This is their biggest problem of all. So they also go down an avenue which leaves them with an equally redundant and fairly useless theory of money. The problem they all have is, in the final instance, you have to come back to Marx. You have to come back to Marx, because if you don't start with a sound theory of price, everything else falls by the wayside. The book I am hoping to write after this is the theory of distribution. Why theory of distribution? 
because there's one fundamental point in there which upsets all economists. How do you define capital? You ask any economist, define capital unambiguously. They can't do it. They simply can't do it. They talk absolute nonsense. They say, oh, capital is machines and factories. In other words, all material inputs except labor. Ask a businessman what is capital. Well, it's the money I spend on all the inputs, including labor. You, you understand the point? That they're trying to say that capital is not labor. That labor gets its return according to its productivity, capital gets its return according to its productivity. So I must distinguish between capital and labor, you understand. Why did they do that? Ideology. Now, once I start thinking like that, I need another price theory. But they end up with such a stupid price theory that really in years to come, people will say, were they really that Neanderthal in those days? Were they really that stupid? Because if you really dissect neoclassical economics, the price theory is so bad that you wonder why we have put up with it for so long. And that's what I try and do in the book, but I do confess not successfully translating that into ordinary language. Uh, because actually you're jousting a bit with windmills, you know, all the time. And sometimes this is a very abstract jousting contest, which is necessary, but one of the things I'm going to try and do eventually is to translate it into the language that I use to teach my students. To make it very simple, very practical, very straightforward, where a business person turns around and says to me, that's how I set my prices. I understand the market. Actually, that is the way the market works. That's what I want people to say. That is really the way the market works. They don't realize that I'm a card-carrying Marxist economist, you know, but they actually appreciate the economics. The worst part of all of this story is, in the end, I'm starting to convert incredibly rich investors to my cause. Because they want to know, well, how do you actually explain all of these things? I'll go back to this. A friend of mine had a big investment fund in 2008, and neoclassical economics tells you, you print a lot of money, you're going to get hyperinflation. So the Federal Reserve was printing and printing and printing, and lots and lots of investment funds started to hedge against this inflation by buying a lot of primary commodities. But in 2008, what you saw was actually no inflation. And worse still, you got a recession where primary commodities collapsed. You see, so they lost a lot of money, but he didn't. He went and boasted, well, we are all supporters of Marxist economics. You know, the idiot didn't even know what Marxist economics was. He just made buckets of money from it, from the analysis. And this is one of those investors who, because he made so much money and he didn't, he started to research Marx, he went and bought one of the last remaining communist manifestos with Marx's signature in it. He paid $350,000 because he said, my God, this guy must be great. You know, he actually must have really understood the market. I, later, he toned it down a bit, but for a while he was so gung-ho, he went and bought two pages of theories of surplus value written in Marx's own hand. Originals, $400,000. You know, this is a big predator investor. For them, it's not a matter of ideology. It's a matter of what really works, what really he can understand in commonsensical terms. Of course, I don't really have the time 